losing too many women Stop the violence against women <laughs> We need to love our women and take care of the women Stop abusing the women We're losing too many Good evening everyone, I'm Wendell Jones and welcome to this special town meeting Zonta says no and if you are aware of what's happening in the Bahamas you will know that Zonta is saying no to violence against women. And we are coming here in a live town meeting at the Jones Communications Complex on University Drive, uh, where we are going to have a number of speakers who are going to present on women saying no to violence and Bahamians saying no generally to violence in our country. We begin this evening's proceedings by asking uh, you in the audience to please rise for the national anthem. Thank you. You may be seated. We now call on Bernadette Gibson, the incoming area director for South Florida and Puerto Rico of Zonta uh, for the prayers. Can we just bow our heads, please, as we pray? God of the entire universe. All people are made in your image. They are known by you and loved by you. All the resources of the world are yours. God, please bring your boundless resources to help women and children around the world who are experiencing violence of any kind. You know each of them by name. We only hear of them, but you see it all. We pray for governments around the world to rule wisely and to make and enforce laws to protect women and children from violence. Please provide support agencies with the resources they need to provide for the needs of victims. And please change the culture that permits, ignores, downplays, or excuses violence against women and children throughout the world. Please give your grace, comfort, and healing to all those who suffer. Amen. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Christie. I beg your pardon, Ms. Gibson. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, in November of 2012, Zonta International launched a global Say No campaign in an effort to raise awareness and help to eradicate violence against women and girls. On November 25th, Zonda, Zonta began 
It's 16 days of activism with the color orange inclusive of ribbons, wristbands, and other related paraphernalia. In continuation of its say no efforts. And so that is the basis of our program this evening. And as I said, we have a very distinguished uh, panel here uh, this evening uh, who are going to address uh, all matters relating uh, to violence. Uh, we further our program by calling on Dr. Teresa Adderley Smith for the welcome. Dr. Smith. Good evening, and thank you, Mr. Jones. According to the August 2015 Strategic Plan to Address Gender-Based Violence, the Bahamas is ranked among the top countries in the Caribbean for gender-based violence. Violence in all forms is devastating and is a devastating human right violation, and it is unacceptable. A pleasant good evening and welcome to Zonta Say No campaign and town hall meeting. This year has brought some good news in the Bahamas as Zonta Clubs of the Bahamas launches the Spotlight Initiative in conjunction with JCN and other corporate partners to eliminate violence against women and girls. I am the co-chair of the campaign and guest host for today, Dr. Teresa Adley Smith. Today marks the third day in the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. This initiative is a global annual campaign established by the United General Assembly since 1999 that runs annually from November 25th through through December 10th, Human Rights Day. The theme for this year is Leave No One Behind and Violence Against Women and Girls. So who is Zonta? Zonta is an organization made up of professional women whose main objective is empowerment of women and girls we seek to ensure that women and girls are provided with opportunities to become well-adjusted, contributing citizens. We want to acknowledge and welcome tonight Parliamentary Secretary uh, Mr. Warren Miller, our distinguished experts and guest panelists, you, our listening audience, and invited guests. You are all a part of a global platform for action within our community to mobilize and call attention to the urgent need to end gender-based violence in all forms. A special good evening to our Zonta presidents, Ms. Claudine, Claudine Farkerson, Club of New Providence, Ruth Ann Rowe, Club of Nassau, the chairperson of the Say No campaign, Mrs. Marissa Mesa Smith, and the second co-chair, Ms. Anne Marie Bain, committee members and all fellow Zonchans. Women and girls are most at risk and most affected by gender-based violence and hence gender-based violence is used interchangeably with, gender, uh, with violence against women. However, boys and men are also affected. Regardless of the target, gender-based is deeply rooted in structural inequalities and social norms between men and women and is characterized by emotional, financial, and physical abuse. As in previous years, the Zonta Club of the Bahamas invites you to orange the world using the color designated by the United Campaign to symbolize a brighter future without violence. For the purpose of this campaign, we have adopted the colors for your consideration as you listen to our upcoming experts answer this question to yourself. Are we achieving that brighter future if yes, what are we doing about it? Are we showing no or just saying no? We begin with our first of three speaker, Ms. Gaynell Curry, after Mr. Jones makes the introduction. Thank you so much and have a great night. Uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Teresa Adley Smith. Uh, as you uh, can see, ladies and gentlemen, we do have, as I said, a distinguished panel here uh, this evening. Uh, but before we go into our panel discussion, uh, we would like to uh, give an opportunity to the uh, Parliamentary Secretary in the Ministry of Social Services and Urban Renewal, my good friend, 
and uh, former broadcaster, uh, the Honorable Vaughan Miller, uh, who will come now and bring remarks. Mr. Miller. Did he never do these right for me, Mr. Joe? Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. It's an honor to be here with the president of the Zonta Club of New Providence, president of the Zonta Club of Nassau, Zonta Advocacy Committee co-chairs, members of the distinguished panel, and to the moderators for the evening, CEO, my good friend and fellow, uh, fraternal colleague in the field of broadcasting, Mr. Wendell Jones and the Dr. Teresa Adderley Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. I am pleased, again, I'm honored to be here this evening to bring a few remarks on this very important topic. Say no to violence against women and girls. I would like to begin by commending the Zonta Club of the Bahamas for organizing this very timely event during the global campaign, 16 Days of Activism to End Violence Against Women and with such a diverse and interesting panel. I am particularly pleased to see that you've included a number of men on this panel. That was a good place for an applause for the men. <laughs> That's a good place. While men are the, I don't, I don't even like to read this, but. I don't even like to share this, but I'm told it's the truth, Dr. Jones, so I have to share it. <laughs> While men are the main perpetrators of violence against women, such violence affects both women and men, as both parties must hurt during and as a result of such violence, especially when it takes place in the context of the family. I welcome the effort to bring gender balance and the diversity to this discussion this evening. As we all know, ending the scourge of violence will require both genders and indeed all of us across all sectors putting our minds to it to come up with solutions. Our hearts must be in it to feel compassion for the victims and our hands in it to do something to help stop the violence against women in the Bahamas. Given the impact of such violence on families across our country, it is, an it is opportune and imperative for us to discuss and to keep this issue at the forefront of our agenda. We must break the cycle of violence and, and the silence around domestic violence. You would be surprised to know who are victims of domestic violence. This is especially important for our children who often witness and sometimes experience themselves violence in the home. Violence does not take place in a vacuum. Indeed, children who witness and experience violence often act out similar violence in other settings. It is crucial that we examine the interconnectedness of the various forms of violence in our country. How does violence in the home influence violence in our schools? How does violence in our homes influence violence on our streets? When we prioritize addressing violence in the home, which must be our first line of defense, I think we will have a good chance of curbing the violence that we see elsewhere in our communities and across this country. Ending all forms of violence in the Bahamas is a priority for this government. At Urban Development, we are doing our part in the communities including in partnership with the police, the churches, and the other civic organizations. Engaging with the community is a good opportunity for us to try to recognize the signs of domestic violence. 
it is an opportunity for us to reach out to women and children who are often shamed into keeping their silence and to offer them support, counseling, and other services. It is an opportunity for us to engage men and boys and to share with them and encourage them toward nonviolent behaviors and the peaceful resolution of conflicts. It is, it is an opportunity for us to engage community leaders and partners and to share good practices as well as resources toward appropriate prevention and response initiatives to end violence against women and other forms of gender-based violence. At Urban Development, we are, we are ready to work with all of you to ensure that each and every woman and the child in our country can enjoy the rights to a life free from violence. I better repeat that. <laughs> At Urban Development, I repeat, we are ready to work with all of you to ensure that each and every woman and girl in our country, and I might as well add, from Grand Bahama to Inagua, <laughs> from Bimini to Meguana, all over the Commonwealth, that they can enjoy the right to a life free from violence. So in closing, I say, let us stand for the rights of all women and the children who face violence. Let us stand up for healthy, happy families. Let us stand up for strong, nonviolent communities and an even stronger and peaceful Bahamas. Thank you for giving me this opportunity, and I wish all of you the best for good deliberations this evening. Say no to violence, especially against women and the children. May Almighty God bless the Zon what is it called? Zontanians? Am I saying it? Zontanians. Zontanians. Don't do this to me on national. Am I national team? Yes, you are. Zontanians. May Almighty God continue to bless all Zontanians. Yes. The entire Commonwealth of the Bahamas and to make the wealth more common. God bless all of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Mr. Miller, uh, for those uh, remarks. And I'm sure you have been well received around the Bahamas. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we said, we have a very distinguished uh, panel here this evening. Uh, they are going to uh, address you. Uh, they are going to be seated. And um, we have given them uh, a few minutes uh, to address you. And uh, hopefully at the end of the addresses, uh, you would be uh, able to uh, ask questions or give comments. Our first speaker this evening is uh, Gaynell Curry, uh, who is the director uh, of the Department of Gender and Family Affairs within the Ministry of Social Services and Urban Development. Uh, Ms. Curry previously served as the Gender and Women's Rights Advisor and Acting uh, Chief of Global Issues for the United Nations Office uh, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in New York. She has a very long bio, very distinguished lady, and it is our pleasure uh, to ask her now to address you. Uh, Ms. Curry. Thank you very much, Mr. Jones. And I just want to say a special good evening to the, my fellow panel members and to all of you in the audience. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to just mention a few um, brief comments about the Department of Gender and Family Affairs and some of the work that we're doing there to respond to gender-based violence and particularly violence against women and girls. And also to um, talk about some of my thoughts and visions in terms of what I think we can be doing a little bit better uh, in addressing this issue in the Bahamas, including through my department. So as we know, the Department of Gender and Family Affairs was established about a year ago, and we've been really prioritizing three areas, and that's empowerment of women and girls, facilitating the country in meeting its international obligations with respect to these issues, and also addressing gender-based violence. And 
our focus, I can say truly, has been on the issue of, of addressing gender-based violence and responding to gender-based violence. We have been working very closely with our partners on this issue and primarily to implement the strategic plan. And I know that Dr. Uh, Robin Roberts is on the panel and is going to speak a little bit more about his role in the task force. But I wanted to mention that as a result of the task force to end gender-based violence, there was a, strate a strategic plan which my department has been um, asked to lead in implementing. And we have started that work, mainly through coordination, pro programming, promotion, and policy development. One of the issues we've found so far and is that this issue affects children as well as adults. It is something that starts much earlier than we would want to hear it starting. We did some assessment uh, in a program that we call My First Harassment, where we identified, we heard basically, that this is an issue, sexual harassment and violence against girls starts as early as age seven in this country. And so this is a particular concern for us. So we've focused our attention on addressing the issue within the school system and working with our partners in the crisis center. I know they have a program that we're supporting on, uh, for children that have been traumatized from violence, experiencing violence themselves or witnessing violence, and we're supporting that. We're working also with um, Dr. Roberts and his plan towards empowering men and boys reclaiming our boys, and we're hoping to have that program um, with him up and running. But the main work that we've been doing recently is addressing sexual violence in school. And we've been going mainly to seventh grade students, and it amazes me that these children have faced and are facing so much. It comes out in their conversation. They say, they have described to us issues of not only sexual harassment, of course, verbal and psychological abuse. They have described physical abuse that they've, they've seen in their home or experienced, and many of them have described sexual abuse and incest. They have said to us questions that make me think we, are, we can do so much more. We have to do more to address this. Children have said, what if this person lives in my home? What if he's touching my sister? What can I do? So we've been speaking to children about finding trusted adults, about finding safe spaces and what that means for them. And I think it's important that we all carry that message. And it's not, this is a violence that follows children, but primarily girls, but not only girls. A lot of the boys also mention this as a concern for them as well, that follows them to their adulthood. And we think that prioritizing children in the department for us is crucial. This is the way that we can begin I'm not saying it's the only way forward. I know that there has to be several levels of addressing this or several tiers or several approaches, but I think that this is crucial if we are to break the cycle for the next generation. We know, and, and as the, the parliamentary secretary said, this is something that's affecting us. It's interrelated, it's interconnected. The violence that takes place in the home is not something that's separate and apart from violence that takes place elsewhere in this country. So we need to really think about how are we addressing this in the homes how are we really dealing with this issue with respect to our children in the school system? And how we are looking at the issue on the streets? How are we responding to it? It's not something that we can do alone, the department, I mean. And I think it's something that the government, um, as much as they can do, cannot do this alone. And we applaud Zonta and other organizations that are working with us. The work that the crisis center is doing is just phenomenal. I, I think that it's it's words that really touches my heart what they've been doing over the years because that's something I know that we could not do on our own in terms of responding to the number of persons out there that need help. The partnerships are important. I would say that one thing that we are lacking and we need to do better on is resources. We need to dedicate the resources to respond to this issue. Talking about it is one thing coming together on this around panels such as this and having very bright people. I think all of us here know this issue well and we have some very knowledgeable country pe persons in the country. And I've been working abroad on these issues. We have very knowledgeable people here in this country on this issue and we know what to do. One of the main challenges for us is resources. If we can get those resources coming through to us, that would be really very important. Those resources require commitment. And I spoke with Mr. Jones a few days ago and he will tell you that I said exactly the same thing, and I think that commitment must come from all levels of society. 
from the very highest, from the government itself, and, also, and it should be seen all the way through as we work on this issue. We must show a commitment to end all forms of violence, particularly as it affects women and girls, particularly as it affects us in the home. Many, it has been said, and my colleagues say to me, you can't say this, Ms. Curry, but I have to say it. Mm -hmm. I think that oftentimes when women are under attack in their own homes, and there, is not, there are not many safe spaces for them to go to. Shelters, if it's a particular concern, the lack of shelters in this country. And just the whole shame around this. We have to break the taboo and the shame around this issue. The shame belongs to the perpetrator, not the victim. And we, sh we ought to keep that in mind. I will wrap up there, and I'm hoping that I'll have another opportunity to jump in on a few thoughts that I have. But I really do applaud Zonta for, for bringing us together to discuss this issue. And I'm looking forward to even further uh, working with you on this. Thank you. Uh, thank you so very much, Ms. Curry. Our next pr presenter this evening is uh, Dr. Robin Roberts, uh, who is a consultant urologist in the Princess Margaret Hospital and currently serves as the director of the University of the West Indies School of Clinical Medicine and Research uh, in the Bahamas. And uh, he has a major interest in men's health and promoting awareness and education in bettering their health. Uh, he's always a good speaker, my good friend, Dr. Robin Roberts. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, Bahamas. I've been allocated a short time to highlight the National Task Force to eradicate gender-based violence. But we must first ask the question, why a task force? I propose to you that the headlines in our news media are far too common. A woman shot to death. A woman chopped to pieces. A woman burnt to death. Superintendent Carswell Hanna documented 45 women murdered in five years, reminding us that to kill her is the final pattern in domestic violence. Mm -hmm. It is too common for our police records on domestic-based violence to suggest that every day, at least one woman in this country reports an encounter of being beaten by a man who claims to love her. It is unacceptable that the United Nations documents reveal that three Caribbean countries are among the top 10 in the world for reported incidences of rape. The Bahamas is tops in the Caribbean. It is far too common that one out of every three women in the Caribbean are victims of domestic violence. And we know that this is a far uh, underestimated numbers because of the shame, as mm -hmm. Dr. Curry mentioned, and the lack of confidence, unfortunately, in our police and justice systems that a lot of women do not report it. So I put it to you that we have a major burden in our society, untold physical and emotional harm to both victims and families, untold loss of productivity in the workplace, mm -hmm. and untold costs to our healthcare system. We have to stop this. We must stop this. It's a national problem. It requires a national effort. Mm -hmm. And against this background, in 2014, the governor the government of the Bahamas established a national task force on gender-based violence with the intent to do just that. The task force, led by retired Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Ruby Nordich, and co-chaired by Dr. Sandra Dean Patterson of the Crisis Center, and myself, and we had a mission to define, to analyze, to strategize, and to eradicate gender-based violence. Our 15-member-plus team was a microcosm of our Bahamian island, uh, of all the communities in our Bahamian islands. We, start, we settled with seven committees, and we targeted the issues of gender-based violence, violence and all its medical, psychosocial, and I would say personal dimensions. We researched the legal aspects with regards to the role of our criminal justice system. We addressed the issues of education and training, communications, surveillance and data collections, and not to be left out, our family islands and its special challenges. 
We examine in depth the why, the when, the who, the what, the where, the how, and the wherefore of gender-based violence in our urban and family island communities, placing a central focus on both the victim and the perpetrator. We studied other regional and global national strategic plans. We had strong input from UN women, from the United Nations Arm for Gender Equality and Seeking to Empower Women. We had the full support of the government, the government, the cabinet, and I would truly be remiss not to give a special thank you to our Honorable Melanie Griffith, the Minister for Social Services at that time. So three years later, we produced a national strategic plan, a near 200-page report to eradicate gender-based violence with seven primary goals, 30 specific objectives, and 64 activities. We were adamant that our work was not going to be relegated to a shelf life existence. But we had, and we wanted to make sure that we were able to start immediately. With the strong input of UN Women, we produced an implementation strategy and we hit the ground running. We had a smart plan, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely objectives. And so we identified 10 low hanging fruits which we felt that we could implement immediately. We wanted to, one, advance community awareness programs. We had public service announcements ready to go and we started. We wanted to provide better care for the victims of the hospitals and better police reporting. We wanted to redefine our sexual response team with advocates supporting the victim during this traumatic ordeal. We sought to establish a domestic violence fatality team, essentially a coroner's case to seek the lessons learned whenever something like this occurred, so we'll hope that it will never happen again. We wanted to better the support for single mothers, maneuvering through the court system for child support so that we could uh, give them better support. We also wanted to introduce early gender-based violence. Uh, we had some select programs in the crisis center. We employed psychologists who volunteered and we specifically targeted those children exposed to violence mm -hmm. and the rehabilitation of our juvenile sex offenders. We organized as well for us to have men at the forefront with women in leading this charge against gender-based violence. So we established men's support group, not only to create them, not only for them to be more aware, but also for support among themselves. And these men, we hope through a train of trainers programs, became the mentors and the counselors in our school prevention program for our boys at risk. We were started, for, we are starting first at the junior schools as a pilot program, and then we seek to, uh, to uh, spread out to all the schools in the public system, and hopefully this will catch on as well to the private school. And uh, we started this, we had workshops for our men and the teachers, and we're looking for that hopefully within the early part of the new year, we will start our after school program. We were fully aware of the challenges of domestic violence in our family islands and the unique challenges in these small island communities where everybody knows everybody. And so we set out to establish family island councils with first responders, family island advocates, and train the police, the nurses, and the key family island community leaders with regards to the issues of gender-based violence. We also recognize the need that the perpetrators need help too. And not only just to do with punishment, but also to provide rehabilitation. The facts are that 80% of men are violent free at 10 years after counseling in a batterers prevention program. So we also sought to expand these battering management programs not only in Nassau, but in the family islands as well. And then, as we heard earlier, we were instrumental in establishing a full Department of Gender and Family Affairs, at the Department of Social Services. And I feel very strongly that there's not only a need for a woman's desk, but there's a need for a man's desk as well, <laughs> where we can focus on male issues, their organizations, and their programs. And finally, we were concerned about sustainability. This is not something that we want to have just this year, 
but that we could continue year after year. And to do this then, we established what was called a gender-based, a gender violence authority. This was a three-tiered system, our gender-based violence authority. And it consisted of a governing board, it consisted of a secretariat, and finally there was a national community council. And that national community council really was a, a federation of all the organizations within the communities, the Boys Brigades, the Girls Guys, Urban Youth Programs, that had an interest in programs related to ending gender-based violence. And the hope are the expectations are that these groups would put together programs and they would be able to refer to the secretariat with the, sec with the, uh, with the technocrats who would be able to assist them in seeking grants and how to write their programs, how to design and how to run them properly. And in so doing, the community would be the ones spurring the programs. And of course, this would all be under the supervision of a board which will comprise not only of, represent, of the delegates from the, from the cabinet, but also with a foundation for gender-based violence. So that we are looking also at funding not only from the government, but also from the private sector. And this would be the entity that would be funding these programs that the community would be uh, uh, sp uh, spiriting in order to end gender-based violence. So we set out to engage the public and to have the public to buy in. And so we expect that our gender-based violence authority will have a major impact on the country. We designed this to be a bottoms-up approach. We looked at this as being a people's movement. And so, ladies and gentlemen, I put it to you that our national task force had everything to do with upping the awareness of gender-based violence, bettering the access to help, and pushing the justice that's required and all we hope with an intent that we would end violence in the Bahamas. And so in conclusion, in conclusion of the short uh, statement, I ask my second question. Where do you stand in the gender-based violence? And I propose to you that if you are not a part of the solution, you are indeed a part of the problem because this is an issue that affects us all. I like to close with my favorite saying, from the American uh, actress, Mexican-American actress, Salma Hayek. She puts it very bluntly. She believes fundamentally. And she says, if you give me any problem in America, I can trace it down to domestic violence. It is the cradle of most of the problems, economic, psychological, and educational. It's time for us to have our task force report in full gear. And I'm looking that you'll be hearing a lot of what we're doing, and we hope you'll be very much a part of what we hope to achieve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Um, Bradley? Yes, thank Adley you. Smith. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. And updating us on what we are doing at the community level, level with domestic violence. Now, you mentioned that one in three women worldwide will experience gender-based violence in her lifetime. Um, Dr. Curry also mentioned that these women need a safe house. Mm -hmm. So coming up next is Pastor Paul Scavallo. He is president of the South Baptist Conference of the Seven-Day Adventists. His Christian and evangelism leadership spans mm -hmm. almost four decades. Dr. Um, Pastor Scavallo is the author of The Blossoming Place, Imperatives for Natural Church Growth. Please welcome to, um, Pastor Paul Scavala as he speaks on spiritual healing in relationships. Thank you, moderators. Um, of course, folk are always interested in the church's position on everything. And in particular, um, this evening, what are our thoughts and our views and our activities as, as it regards to this whole matter of violence against our women and our daughters. And um, while I speak specifically about the position of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, I believe it has tones of all of Christendom um, here this evening. And as members of, of the household of faith of the church, 
We speak with one voice when it comes to this matter of violence against our women and our young ladies. The global statistics indicate that in all societies, women and girls are more frequently the victims of violence as mentioned here earlier. Actions or threats likely to result in physical, sexual, or psychological harm or suffering are incompatible with biblical ethics and Christian morality. Totally incompatible. Such actions include, but are not limited to, family violence, rape, female genital mutilation, honor killings, um, and dowry murders in other parts of the world, not so much in our sections, but we have a worldwide perspective on this matter as a church. And manipulation, denial of personal liberty, and coercion are also acts of abuse and violence. To such behaviors, the church says, let's end it now. As a matter of fact, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a whole program entitled, Let's End It Now. And as, as a church, we believe that this is important because the church Im is made up of persons in our community. And as, as, as leaders in the community, from a religious perspective, we see it on a day-to-day -day basis. I've had the experience of being called to murder scenes where husbands have murdered their wives and I had to cradle infants in my hand and that of my wife's um, assistants where blood was all over the place and uh, um, being able to have to um, assist in circumstances like this. And so because we believe that everybody is created in the image of God and as such has been given a dignity that is second to none, as a church, we have to engage in helping to support and to help in situations that uh, breed violence. Now, the measure of that worth is seen, we believe, in the sacrificial death of Christ on Calvary's cross. He died so that every human being and, it, and the value of that human being is put to the forefront, and we are all valuable. The love and compassion that characterize the earthly life of Jesus sets an example for all believers and all followers. Jesus was not willing that any should perish, that any should be abused under any circumstance. It is totally against the principles of the Bible and of Christ. And so, as a result of this, as a church, we believe that violence against women is something that is not imaginary. It is real, and we see it, and we have to address it on a daily basis, both within the church and without the walls of the church. It is also a historical matter. This is not something that is new. <laughs> History shows us that violence has been with us from the very beginning. And it has manifested itself in so many ways. And I, we believe that one of the greatest deterrents to violence against women is helping, as Dr. Roberts has mentioned, to help our men to understand the God-given roles that have been given to them to be the house band of the home that which protects and secures, and that which Ephesians describes as being the savior of the home. Many men abuse the Bible, and they would call upon texts like, the man is to be the head of the home. Mm -hmm. I had a lady say to me one time, well, you might be the head, but I'm the neck on which that head turns. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but head does not mean boss when we look at it carefully, is actually the head as Christ was the head. And Christ was willing to die for his wife. 
And so when I marry folk, I always say to the women, did you ask this man if he's willing to die for you? <laughs> it's a very important question because it is, it, is, it is highlighted in the word of God. Secondly, violence against women happens because in many instances, we allow it to happen. And so we try to train our women and our men that they must resist it under all circumstances. And this is sometimes very difficult. In many instances, we celebrate violence in movies and on social media, and we laugh and we have fun with it. We must reject this. If we embrace it, then we perpetuate the problem. And so we teach our members to reject movies with this type of thing in it. We ought not to embrace it because the Bible says, by beholding, we become what? Changed. You keep looking at something, then you become like the something you look at. All right? The church is sometimes, and I, 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 I might get some flack for this, but the church is sometimes guilty of passive violence. And what do I mean by this? Sometimes we turn our head to the violence. We have women who come to see us as pastors, and they've been brutalized by their husbands. And we say, let's pray about it. Maybe it'll get better. And, and, and the record doesn't show that. Sometimes we need to remove ourselves from this violence and, and seek the help and the rehabilitation and then look at the, the matter afterwards. Violence against women is, is visible in societies through sometimes the statutes and the laws that are in place. And that has to be uh, looked at. And sometimes the church can aid in this in suggesting ways and means by which we can upgrade our laws. Too many men have been taught that the women are of lesser value than men. And the church has a significant role in helping to teach that God has created all men and women equal. Yes. Mm -hmm. And as I conclude, sometimes as a church, we can do much more than we do. And we pray that as we understand the needs and become more sensitive to them, that we will engage in the process of helping to make our world a safer world and a better place for our women and for our daughters. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Pastor Scavala. Uh, we are here on the JCN Live Town Meeting, uh, sponsored by the Zonta Club of the Bahamas, and they are saying no to violence, and of course we are encouraging Bahamians everywhere to say no to violence. We take this commercial break on our program, and uh, we'll be right back. Losing too many women, stop the violence against women. We need to love our women and take care of the women, stop abusing the women.